Hello, and welcome to this talk sponsored by the Society for Libyan Studies, one of the British Academy's research institutes. My name is Robert Foley, I'm the one on the right, and I am the president of the Society for Libyan Studies. I'm also the Levy Hume Professor of Human Evolution at the University of Cambridge, and the work I want to talk about was carried out with Professor Marta Mirazan La on the left, who is the Professor of Human Evolution and Prehistory at the University of Cambridge as well. And what I want to talk about <coughs> is lithic landscapes. Lithics refers to the stone tools that prehistoric people made and used. And what we want to talk about is uh, a part of the Central Sahara, the Mesak, uh, where we have learnt an enormous amount about the rich nature of the stone tool record. And we are th the theme is, uh, as I said here, the ecology of stone in a desert environment. So we walk on many landscapes and we don't even notice the stones on which we walk. And <coughs> mostly they are just stones. But in some parts of the world, when you look down and you look carefully, you can discover that many of those stones are in fact discarded artifacts, stone tools made by prehistoric peoples. And usually they're quite scarce. Many of you will have come across these in different parts of the world walking along. But in some parts of the world, they're very rich. And we discovered this when we were working uh, in the Fezzan. This was part of uh, the Desert Migrations Project, sponsored by the Society for Libyan Studies, uh, a project looking at uh, prehistory and environment in the Fezzan. And it was led by uh, David Battingley uh, from the University of Leicester and uh, Marta Mirizan La. And David was concerned with the, uh, the uh, Garamantes, the civilizations of the last thousand, two thousand years in the Central Sahara. And what we were looking at was the much deeper prehistory uh, in the Abari Sansis and in the Mesak. So <coughs> this is a, a a close-up of it and the, the coloured in zones, the dark red zone is the Ubari and the, uh, the green area, which is what I want to talk about mostly, uh, is the Mesak and that is a, uh, a Mesozoic ridge, it runs for uh, more than 100 kilometres. Uh, it's like a, a spine that runs between the sand seas uh, and it's exposed rock uh, and, and very, very rich. It's a, it's a silicified sandstone. Uh, and the Desert Migrations Project, we looked at a, a variety of things, we did major surveys across the landscapes in the, in the, in the sand seas themselves and also, as seen in the top left here, surveyed and excavated in the Mesak itself. So the point here is that the Ubari sand seas and the Mesak have very rich records of stone tools. And uh, we discovered this partly through general surveys driving across the landscape and also as a result of a major, very intensive investigation carried out as part of a, uh, a, a cultural environmental heritage management program when the oil company uh, Occidental were uh, about to start explorations and exploitation in the region of the, of, of the Mesak. And what this shows, these dots shows here, just the idea of the richness of lithic finds if you walk intensively across this landscape. Now, the Pleistocene record, uh, lithic record, of uh, the, the, the Abari and the Mesak uh, is very extensive and it covers all the major periods. Now, the first technologies we know from East Africa go back three million years or more. Uh, we don't know how old these are, but we find evidence of uh, stone tools very similar to the earliest mode one technologies, the older one technologies found in East Africa. We find very extensive evidence for the Ashelaean, otherwise known as mode two technologies. These are the classic bifacial hand axes that we see all the way from Cape Town up through Eurasia uh, and, in, 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 and across all of Western Europe. And we also find uh, extensive evidence of the Middle Stone Age, mode three, the prepared cord technologies that are occur somewhere between 300 to 400,000 years ago uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and spread uh, probably from there. And we, 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 we have an extensive 
ever record of these in uh, the, the, the Libyan Sahara. Now the Mesak Setafet is, as I said, it's a, it, 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 it's a plateau really, it's a ridge, a spine that sits up, a, sits up above uh, the sand seas. You can see in the top picture here how the sand seas are there in the background and then this very rocky uh, escarpment and landscape uh, which is uh, made up of, of, of Mesozoic rocks highly eroded, broken up, and we can see from the, the smaller uh, insets at the bottom that it creates a sort of pavement of stones, a pavement of stone, which is what we started to investigate. And what we found, if you walk across this landscape, and you can see various pictures of it here, and you look more closely, you discover that very large numbers of these stones are in fact stone tools. Now, some of them are rather plain and ordinary and most people might not recognize them as stone tools. Others are of extraordinary beauty and uh, clearly uh, a lot of effort has, has gone into making them. The ones we can see at the bottom here are, are, are very classic Middle Stone Age Lavalois technology. So we find these everywhere and uh, we found them uh, as we surveyed in the, in the, uh, the, the, the Oxy survey we found many many and he began to ask well, just how common are they? How frequent? And so we started to, to look at this more closely. And I won't go through all the methods here. You can, you can look at them in that we, we surveyed uh, the area. And basically every hundred meters in both a north-south and an east-west direction over, uh, over an area of about um, uh, 140 square kilometers, uh, two, two by two meter plots were sampled. And you see what we saw at the bottom, which is that these are random points on the landscape and 60% of them contained lithics. And that's probably a minimum because often the lithics might be not that easy to recognise. And about 17% of them had moderate to high densities. In other words, you can find several lithics there. And this is really an extraordinary rate of recovery. And it made us think about this idea here of lithic landscapes and the way in which uh, uh, here we have a landscape which is, looks natural, it looks as if it is simply the product of geological formation, breakup and erosion, but when you look at it closely it has an extraordinary imprint of human activity uh, upon it. And the, the, the key thing is it goes on for miles and miles. Now this isn't a terribly good video but this is just filming, driving along the Messac and you can see as you look out through the window, these just on and on and on. And while not all of these are artifacts, a very large number of them probably are. So what happens if we look at this in a bit more detail? And we did some random samples. Again, we don't need to worry too much about the details. I just want to tell you uh, the, the, the main result. And that is, if you take a random square around the, the, the parts of the Messac we looked at, uh, we found that there was an average of about 75 lithics per square meter. Now that's an extraordinary density. It means that this is a landscape which has effectively been, uh, has a dominant part played by humans across an enormous period of time. Now, the Mesak is, is, uh, is, is in one particular area. Um, similar surveys have been carried on in other parts of the world. I actually did a similar one for my PhD uh, many, many years ago in East Africa and found there a lithic density of 19,000 per square kilometre. And that seemed to be uh, high. Uh, Glenn Isaac, working in Kubafora in northern Kenya, suggested for a Pleistocene deposit, lower Pleistocene, 40,000 artefacts per square kilometre. Uh, a later study looking in, in the Nubian high desert came up with figures that ranged from a million to 12 million. But the MESAC, if you add the 75 per square metre, comes out at 75 million artefacts per square metre. This is just an extraordinarily high figure. Now, what does it mean? Well, as I said, it's not the only place in the world we find these sorts of deposits. There's a site in Israel where these mounds are, uh, of, of worked material are there coming, dating back to the Middle Pleistocene, dating back over 100, 200,000 years old. So going back to the very beginnings of modern humans and indeed almost certainly 
in the Mesak, going back beyond into uh, species earlier than us, possibly Homo heidelbergensis or even Homo erectus, using the landscapes in these ways. And that's why I wanted to emphasize that this is the, this is the ecology of stone, because if we look at this, this, this uh, landscape here, we can see in the foreground the rich deposits uh, of, 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 of stones which can be used, and indeed were used until very recently, and then in the background uh, the sand seas. And of course the sand seas have no stones in them at all. So if you are going to exploit this region, if you're going to use it and imagine it uh, in a period when it's wetter and there's savannah and forest and woodlands and, and grasslands out there, the Messac would have been a central resource, not necessarily for plants and animals, but a central resource for stone. And so when we think about the ecology of humans in the past, and we think often about what they had to eat and what they, where they could find water and shelter, but our ancestors were technologically dependent, just as we are. And so access to stone was an important thing. It's part of their landscape, part of their resources. And almost certainly we're seeing here something that we now living with on a catastrophic scale, which is the first ways in which humans, hominins, our ancestors, had an impact on the environment and changed it. Not very radically, but changed the landscape here. And this is a, 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 a major source of information. I have to say, it's also a major source of pleasure. Uh, this is one of our Spanish colleague, Maillo, and uh, the excitement he had. It's a, a lithic specialist walking over this landscape. You can see in his face. So uh, when one walks across a landscape and sees rocks, we should be thinking uh, not necessarily just about their geology and their beauty, but how they are central to our own evolution.